So, is there anyone who'd like to start off with uh, any questions to us? Yes, sir. Uh, my question's for Rupert, Daniel O'Brien from the Manson Unit. Rupert, is there two questions really? One, what was the penicillin sensitivity in Keftrioxone for the strep pneumoniae? And the second thing is, that, is the sensitivity testing an automated uh, testing machine or is it actually just done by disc diffusion uh, with plates on, on, on a desktop? So, disc is diffusion? It, uh, is that one of the things where you put in a, a culture and then you get a, a readout of sensitivities or is it a much more manual system? It's manual. Right, yeah. So it's a disc diffusion. Um, and for, so 100% sensitivity to ceftriaxone, and I didn't include it here because it wasn't part of our routine analysis. We're still working on it for penicillin MICs, so more to come. And to differentiate bloodstream and CSF. Thank you very much. We've got something online, have we? Um, yeah, we have one question from online from... Um, a nursing colleague, Stephen Flanagan, for Josie Gilday, to say what practical steps should MSF take in order to increase the quality of nursing care in their projects? Okay, well, um, I think steps are actually already being taken. So now every um, MSF section actually has an individual nursing advisor. Um, and I think one of the struggles, really, with, with the practical steps to take is that they're there are quite a lot of them. <laughs> um, but first, it would be that nurses really in the field should just be nurses. Now, I loved being in the field and being the pharmacist and in charge of the kitchen and the nutritional kitchen. I thought, wow, this is a great challenge. Woohoo! And, you know, I'm not just nursing. But then it made me realize that I was starting to neglect my nursing role. And, and I, I don't know if you will have noticed, but on that, that theoretical framework I developed, I missed out meeting the needs the basic needs of the patients, because I'm so used to having the caretakers. And that really shocked me. And so I think that's a really practical thing we need to look at. What is the role of a nurse and what isn't? Because so many times we end up running the pharmacy and other, and other <laughs> things like that. I think one of the other important things as a nurse I'm talking is you're very much in the field helping people to help themselves. So as a nurse, yes, you are going in there, but you're not just doing the individual nursing care of the patient, mm -hmm. you're training the caretaker to do, to do the work, so it's helping them to help itself, so important. Yeah. At the back there on the right. Hi, this is another message for Josie as an NHS nurse at the DTN. Um, I just wanted to ask if um, an overly systematic approach do you think potentially takes away from a holistic nursing care aspect? Yeah, I think it's really difficult to find, to find that balance. Um, but what I really think we need to look at is Currently, there are limitations to our organisation and systematic structures. And in, in this case, in the study, I found that nurses were really task orientated and really only around the administration of medication. But what had happened was they were also mini pharmacists. So they were counting the drugs in the morning. They were then making an order for them. They were then going to the pharmacy to collect them. And actually, so this, this system had narrowed their view um, of nursing care and, and prevented them really from having that holistic view. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely difficult to find that balance. But I think it's something in MSF we, we need to explore more. And I think the starting point is really, let's base our care around meeting the needs of the patient and work out from there to create our systems. Thank you very much. A lady in red at the back. I hope the microphone works this time. Hope it works now. So, uh, Marta, again, in fact, this is uh, Doctor. This question is for Charles. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, which potential predictors dropped of your model. Did you look at spleen size or malnutrition? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, we looked at other predictors. And uh, spleen size was dropped, malnutrition was dropped, weakness was dropped. And uh, yeah, I think that was it. Age, young age as well. Yeah. But nevertheless, I also should say that most of the predictors we had in the score are some of the predictors we commonly collect in settings where we work. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Uh, 
Uh, hi, uh, I'm Giuseppe, a medical microbiologist in the NHS. A uh, question for Rupa. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, very nice. Uh, just a couple of questions I wanted to ask you. It's very interesting that you were mentioning that it's such a high rate of uh, ESBL positive and you're not actually, you haven't found any MRSA positive bacteria. Is he a common finding as well in, uh, in adults or it's uh, just something that, uh, that uh, you know, you've noticed in kids, or you might find some bacteria. And the other thing is that you were saying that uh, uh, you were trying to review the, um, the uh, antibiotic choice, the first line choice for antibiotics moving from cefraxone. I mean, have you thought about something? I mean, because, you know, with regards to the sensitivity, I mean, most of the strains of enterobacteria acid were for instance sensitive to amicacin. Were you thinking about revising your choice? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so, in response to the first question about rates of MRSA and ESBL, um, is it a common finding? I guess this speaks to a bigger issue about documentation of rates of <coughs> antibiotic resistance. Um, so, the short answer is I don't know. I think nobody knows um, because there is such a paucity of good quality data, particularly, I mean, I think this is a problem across much of resource poor settings, but certainly in places where MSF works. Um, I mean, there is some data coming out of West Africa, Ghana, uh, reporting that 70% of their Klebsiella isolates were ESBL producing. Um, I didn't look it up for Staph aureus. Um, yeah, I didn't look it up for Staph aureus. I can, and there was a second part to that question comparing adults to kids. So we only focus on the pediatric in this project, so I have no information whatsoever about adults in the population. Um, and with regards to ceftriaxone as a first line, uh, yeah, I think we are not yet in a position to change ceftriaxone out of our first line. Uh, I think where there is a role is considering a second antibiotic, as you say, like potentially gentamicin or amikacin, um, just a broader, broadened spectrum. I would try to reserve that, though, for those patients that have identified bloodstream infections with a gram-negative or Klebsiella and or E. coli in particular. Okay, well, thank you very much. At the back there, lady in black and white. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Val Snewin with the UK Department of Health. And um, I just wanted to follow up on the antibiotic resistance issue at the bigger picture level where you were just going. Um, t firstly, to ask, is there a place where you can log that data at that kind of global or national level, maybe with WHO or some kind of database? And secondly, just to note that um, the, in the UK Department for Health, there is a, a planning stage going on for an initiative to build up lab capacity specifically around antibacterial um, resistance, so AMR, but only for the kind of bacteria you're talking about. And so it would be great, actually, to follow up later and to make sure that we can join that, join that up into, into the planning phases. Thanks. So in response to the first question, I think there are several initiatives um, to try to improve surveillance of antibiotic resistance globally. Um, the WHO-led GLASS initiative is meant to be a worldwide surveillance system. Um, and in theory, that's great. In reality, there are still many deficits. Um, most of sub-Saharan Africa it remains a gaping hole in terms of microbiology data. Um, likewise, the Middle East. So I think there's I think there's increasing enthusiasm and desire to have these structures be more robust and actually do the job of surveillance. Um, so hopefully that will, and MSF is actively participating in those discussions. Um, hopefully that will become more robust with time. The other thing, the other caveat that I would add is that surveillance data is really difficult to use to inform guidelines for sepsis. 
So that's a slightly annoying nuance, but I'd be happy with better surveillance data. And yes, building live capacity. I mean, for me, you can't talk about antibiotic resistance without having access to microbiology. I mean, we can wait, and we are waiting for adapted rapid tests for the field, but in the meantime, we're building labs and we are trying to partner with external laboratories that can ensure some quality. So that's been our approach in OCP. Gentleman in the middle here. Um, my question is to Marwa. Um, I think that the focus on, on male uh, sexual violence is, is quite welcome. Um, but I just wanted to ask whether you, you, you looked at the knowing also that um, in MSF projects, we, we recognize that even for female sexual violence, we're not uh, um, actually doing well yeah. enough. Um, did you look at whether what you were concluding on is, is, is it a relative um, situation as in it's as bad in males as it is in women based on um, what potential is happening out there. Um, and kind of the second part to that is, if you make adjustments um, as in your recommendation, is there a risk that then the um, uh, women, uh, women's access is, is reduced? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a study, it's still new, still ongoing, so we are still adjusting for a lot of factors. Uh, but right now we are really considering the main factor, which is the access of male victim to care according to the setup. So as I have explained earlier that some of the setups uh, only offer MCH access. And we know uh, from the field that those are areas of active conflict. So we are expecting a higher percentage of males presenting to our services compared to females. And this was actually not a true scenario because we only found like 3% out of uh, the whole victims that we are receiving. And again, still, uh, we are adjusting for a lot of factors uh, while the study is still uh, ongoing. But yeah, it's still, we are not capturing, like under-reporting is affecting both gender, males and females. Javed from MSF. Charles, I'm really excited by your presentation. Can I extract, with Kieran's permission, a uh, promise for you to come back next year and give us a, 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 um, an update on implementing that tool and, and what you find? Uh, and secondly, Marwa, um, the question was half sort of covered, actually, a little bit by this last question. Um, can you give us an idea of sort of the general setting is the setting where you think we might be able to uh, it was the easier point of entry for, for mm -hmm. male exactly. victims of sexual mm -hmm. violence. Do you, do you get an idea of, or do you have an idea of what question we can ask for, you know, as a clinician in those settings, having been there in these projects? Is there an opener that we can just use? You know, we, you know, we were famously taught with suicide. It doesn't, you know, you can ask, are you feeling suicidal? It doesn't bring up those ideas in the person. You should feel safe that you can ask that. Is there such a question that we can extract, you know, to help this person um, volunteer that they've uh, suffered that abuse? Um, okay, so I haven't been in all uh, the context, but I can speak from some of them. So, um, and I can relate to one of the patient's story that he accessed uh, one of the services for a totally different reason. And it was actually one of our mental health uh, services, and we didn't know that he is an SV victim. And he was not improving, and he refused to uh, like talk to a lot of uh, the people providing care. And when, uh, like I remember after maybe four to five consultations uh, of mental health consultation, he finally declared that he was an SV victim, and that was the primary reason behind his uh, mental illness. So, I know that it's a very, um, there is no like ideal question to ask the patient to encourage him while he was an SV event. No, but what we can offer is that we can develop more or less sensitive tools and offer more options or more opportunities for a male victim to declare SV uh, while uh, receiving different kinds of care through MSF. Hi, uh, this is a question for, for Marwa uh, as well, following up on, on Javid's uh, question. What were the main um, uh, reasons for consultation of the men accessing these services? Do, do you have an idea of that? 
Okay, uh, so it's according to the setup. Uh, so for like a vertical SV project, it's clear from the start he is an SV victim. But if we uh, spoke about like um, a general care facility, which is uh, the situation here, uh, he can access for like mental health consultation or any other kind of uh, violence, like to say he's a victim of torture, but it's not necessarily uh, an SV, and he can declare SV uh, later on. Oh, this answer the question? Okay, so he can access our service, and, and he said like he, he's one of the victims of torture, or he's suffering from certain mental health disorders like PTSD or, uh, um, or just general anxiety, because the general care setup that we classified here in project uh, is basically clinics that has been set for mental health disorders or any kind of violence. Uh, not necessarily sexual violence. Um, and we offer several opportunities for disclosure while the patient is receiving our care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hi, my name is Nora from MSF Germany. I've got a question for Marva as well. Um, so I'm wondering about the entry points. Is there a right to tell if people are, so if the victims of sexual violence, regardless of the gender, are using, tend to use the um, general care facilities more than the specific SV facilities? Sorry, I, and I if missed so, this point. Sorry, uh -huh. so is there a way to tell whether there are more victims of sexual um, violence accessing the um, general care facilities or the SV um, specific facilities? And if so, is there a difference between, is there then a difference in gender? And if so, how do you prioritize? Yes, uh, so as um, I've discussed earlier, this is one of the limitations because unfortunately we don't, we don't have the three kinds of setup in a single context or in a single country, because like one setup is in one country and the other in the other country. And, and we really are trying to adjust for contextual factors. But from what we have seen, that the other kind of setup, like let's say MCH or um, SV clinics, are based in areas with a very high um, or active conflicts. And, and we know from the ground and, and, and from our HP work that people there are experiencing uh, sexual violence. So we are expecting like more people to attend our services. Okay. In the middle. Right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, my name's Kabung and I'm from a charity um, that's called Forward and we work on FGM. My question's for Marwa and I'm interested to know how this study could be used to develop um, programs um, with male victims of SV and if, if, it, if it's used alongside a program that engages with the community to break down any stigma attached to um, men who have gone through SV or even females as well. Okay, um, thank you for this because this is actually um, under discussion right now because we are trying to implement uh, qualitative components into uh, the study and to reach people in community and, and to know actually the perception of uh, people uh, living in those communities. And actually, um, uh, we are also investigating the integration between SV as an incident and, uh, let's say, uh, psychological illness. So based on the results, and we hopefully um, want to use this uh, on operational uh, level to implement it to improve the access more. Uh, so far in this study, we have like two out of the eight projects only offering this kind of um, uh, setup that offers a victim to declare SV at several points. But, um, and, and it's relatively huge numbers, so we are currently under, going under so many studies to investigate whether, uh, like, uh, how we could develop the program more to improve the access and, and the care for the patients. Last question. Anyone's got no? No, well, I'll, oh, one last one here, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Katie from MSF. I'm struggling to really formulate this question, actually, so I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, I'm curious, MSF isn't regularly engaging patients or caretakers or um, staff in analysing or understanding whether our quality of care of the services that we're providing is good. And my question, I guess, is mostly for Josie. Um, did you experience any resistance within the project uh, from the staff 
about this, this study that you did? And if you did, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and secondly, you know, do you have any ideas of, if you did have some resistance, how we move MSF forward in, in sort of trying to move beyond the test and treat relationship? I actually was expecting some resistance with the project, but actually I, I had very little from nurses and caretakers. Um, the nurses especially were very eager to come forward and have their voices heard. Um, and so actually a few of them turned up with a list. <laughs> and I was a bit like, oh, okay, I hadn't quite, I hadn't quite thought about this happening. And actually the patients um, and the caretakers, every, every morning I, I would go in and reintroduce myself and explain what I was doing. And they were also very eager to explain to them what was important. Um, and what was really interesting was they also wanted to explain the importance of the nurses and the nursing care um, and how important it was to them. So I, I received very little resistance and I think that's possibly maybe to do with the setting and, and the way people are in Sierra Leone and they're very happy to talk to you. Um, but I think if I did receive resistance, then yes, you've, you've lost a very important channel of knowing how to improve your quality care. Um, because it was really only through understanding what the nurses and caretakers defined quality medical care as that we were able to see the gaps that were occurring. So I'm not quite sure how you would deal with it if there was, yeah, those well, problems. Thank you very much indeed. I think that's very thought-provoking <laughs> presentations. Thank you, Charles, Rupert, Marva and Josie, and a stimulation discussion. So thank you very much indeed.